JD, and this week on NASA Now, a veteran spacewalker will drop by to talk about the nuts and bolts of spacewalking. But before we get to that, let's find out what else is happening at NASA Now. Nothing is left to chance prior to liftoff of STS-133. The six astronauts who will fly Space Shuttle Discovery to the International Space Station spent four days at NASA's Kennedy Space Center to participate in a launch countdown dress rehearsal. Officially, it's called a TCDT, which stands for Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test. In four days' time, the astronauts and launch crews rehearse everything from suit up to countdown, including all safety and emergency measures. Looks like all systems are go for November 1st. Now let's travel back to the past. 26 years ago this month, the Space Shuttle Challenger launched from NASA's Kennedy Space Center on an historic eight-day mission. During the flight, Katherine Sullivan became the first U.S. woman to walk in space. This week, preparations continue for the November 1st launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Discovery will be carrying critical spare parts, an external platform, and a multi-purpose module to the International Space Station. Discovery's mission also features two spacewalks, and today's special guest has performed five spacewalks on two previous missions. Let's find out who he is and what type of equipment he uses when he's walking in space. One of the most vivid memories I have is the first time I ever came out of the airlock on my first spacewalk and looking down, seeing the Earth go by, it's pretty cool. A lot of people have seen pictures of astronauts in this big white suit with a helmet on, and we call it an EMU, which stands for Extravehicular Mobility Unit. You first put on the lower, the the legs and put on the pants part of the suit and then you shinny up into this upper part which is very stiff and hard to contort yourself into but once you get inside it it's a nice comfortable fit and uh, the suit provides everything that you need to you know sustain you when you're outside in, in the vacuum of space you know it has oxygen obviously for you to breathe cooling to keep you cool inside there because you know when we're going around the earth every 90 minutes we're on the sun side we're on the dark side it can fluctuate the temperature from 200 degrees positive to minus 200 degrees so this suit has to be able to you know keep you cool you know no matter what the outside temperature is and then it has to have electricity to power the suit and radios so that you can talk and figure out what you're supposed to be doing but it's just hard to work in because you know, this suit is inflated to 4.3 PSI and, and you know, when you blow up a latex glove, you know, and the fingers stick straight out, well, when you blow up this suit, you pressurize this suit, the same thing happens to those fingers of the glove and it's hard. Every time you bend your fingers to grab onto a tool or onto a handrail, it's like you're squeezing a tennis ball. You don't know how you're gonna feel the first time you go on a spacewalk. You know, what if you felt like, hey, I'm falling, you know, the whole time? That would be a little disconcerting. It would be hard to do your job if you felt like, you know, you're on that ladder 30 feet above your, your sidewalk at home, you know, we're cleaning out the gutters and you gotta hold on, you know? Well, I gotta hold on at home, but, you know, in space, you don't want that feeling that, hey, I'm, I'm hanging out here, I'm gonna fall. We start out training for the spacewalks on, on the ground before we ever fly the mission. We start out about a year ahead of time with this big team team of instructors, people that are training us. We have divers in the big swimming pool that we train in in Houston that help us out while we're practicing these spacewalks underwater. And uh, then, of course, we're up in space. We have a team on board the space shuttle and the space station helping us get to wherever we need to be, maybe with a robotic arm to drive us around, somebody helping us with procedures. Uh, you might have a little trouble maybe with a bolt. and tell the people in the ground, you know, mission control, hey, this bolt's not doing what it's supposed to do, what do you guys think? And mission control will say, okay, give us a couple seconds to talk about it. All the engineers on the ground, this big team that they have will converse and say, hey, what should, what should we do, you know? And maybe they'll say, hey, get a pry bar out, you need a little more force, you know, into this bolt to make it work or something like that. So yeah, teamwork is definitely the key to success in space. 
Do you have a burning question you'd like to ask astronaut Mike Foreman? Well, if so, check the NASA Explorer School's website for information about a live chat. Coming soon. Did you know that a process developed by NASA while refining helmet visors for astronauts led to scratch-resistant lenses for eyeglasses and sunglasses? Now you know. Now it's time to find out what's up. The moon is Earth's largest natural satellite and can easily be viewed on any clear night. You can observe it up close using a pair of binoculars or telescope. This week, the moon enters its final quarter phase. The shadows cast by the moon's craters and mountains are more distinct now, especially along the Terminator, that line where light meets dark. Check it out. You'll be surprised at what you see. Now it's your turn. Check out this week's challenge on the NASA Now homepage. Try your hand at building a robotic hand. Using common everyday materials, you can manufacture a robotic hand that functions in many ways like your own hand. Check it out. Find the design and instructions in the extension activities section of the STS-133 NASA Now webpage. Well, that's it for NASA Now. Be sure to tune into the virtual campus next week when we'll continue our conversation with astronaut Mike Foreman. We'll see you then on NASA Now. NASA Now comes to you from the virtual campus at NASA Explorer Schools.